ever get that feeling, you know, like someone's walking across your grave. Yeah. Even if you don't believe in ghosts, there's something about a good haunting that just gets under your skin. Right. And today we're diving deep into the world of paranormal investigation with Richard Estep's memoir, In Search of the Paranormal. What's so compelling about Estep's book is that it's more than just typical ghost stories. Right. It's his personal journey from a curious kid fascinated by the supernatural to a seasoned paranormal investigator. It's like he's taking us along on his investigations, right? Mm -hmm. You can practically feel the chill in the air as he's describing these haunted locations, but he doesn't just jump into the deep end without a plan. We learn that even as a kid, growing up in Hull, England, Estep was already trying to analyze the rules of the ghostly world. He had this experience in his childhood home, an apparition of an old lady, and instead of just being scared, he started categorizing, is it haunting the place? Right. An object, a person. Exactly. Yeah. And that methodical approach, that attention to detail, it becomes a hallmark of his professional investigations later on. He highlights in the book how crucial it is to do your research, digging into historical records, talking to other investigators, you know, really understanding the context of a haunting before you even set foot in a potentially haunted location. Which makes sense, right? You don't show up to a crime scene without doing your homework first. But there's this one story from his childhood that really stuck with me. It involved his step-uncle almost having a fatal accident. This story is incredible. A step step uncle was about to walk into a room where there was a potentially deadly electrical issue when he was stopped by the apparition of a man. This ghostly figure essentially saved his life. Wow. It's a powerful example of how paranormal experiences can be both unsettling and strangely protective. If I had an experience like that, I don't know if I'd be able to sleep with the lights off. It really highlights that for East Step, this isn't just about collecting spooky stories, it's personal. These experiences shape his beliefs, his career, his entire worldview. And that personal touch makes his investigations all the more compelling for the reader. We're not just getting a dry recounting of events, we're seeing how these encounters affect him, how they challenge his assumptions, and how they ultimately lead him deeper into the world of the paranormal. And speaking of going deeper, let's talk about some of the places Estep investigates in England. One that really sent shivers down my spine was St. Botolph's Church, which locals have nicknamed the Demon Church. Even the name sends chills down your spine. Estep sets the scene beautifully, talking about the local legends, the rumors of satanic rituals, even this mysterious mist that supposedly surrounds the church. He really draws you into the atmosphere of the place, making you feel like you're right there with him. He even mentions finding decapitated chickens scattered around the graveyard. That's not something you see every day, and it definitely adds to the creepiness factor. But what I found most interesting was his approach to the investigation. He's incredibly thorough, even before he gets to the church. He talks about reading a book called Ghostbusters UK by Robin Furman, which details various haunted locations in England. He also mentions reaching out to other paranormal investigators who've been to St. Baltals, gathering their insights and experiences. It's like he's building a case file, piecing together the history and the mystery of the location. It really shows how seriously he takes this work. He's not just running around with an EMF reader hoping for a blip on the radar. He's approaching it with a detective's mind, looking for clues and patterns that might help explain the unexplainable. Absolutely. He even talks about how different the church felt during the day compared to at night. He visited during the day, and it was peaceful, almost serene. But as soon as darkness fell, the atmosphere changed. It became colder, more oppressive, and the energy was palpable. It's like the veil between worlds thinned as the sun went down. Okay, that is both fascinating and terrifying. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder if our own senses play tricks on us in these environments, or if there's something more at play that we just don't fully understand. And that's what makes Estep such a compelling guide through this world. He's not afraid to ask the tough questions, to acknowledge the limitations of our understanding, and to remain open to the possibility that there are forces at work that we may never fully comprehend. So Estep's at this supposedly demonically active church. He's got all his research right. But then something happens that really highlights how ghost hunting isn't just about poring over old books and maps. Oh, yeah. It's about being ready for anything. You're talking about the incident with the light in the field, right? Yes. It's a great example of how quickly things can shift from spooky to hilarious in this field. Yeah. Estep and his team spot this light in the distance and think, this is it. We've got something. But as they investigate further, 
it turns out to be a couple using their car headlights to scare people. Can you believe that? You almost have to admire their ingenuity. Yeah. Though I'm sure Estep didn't find it quite so funny at the time. No, but it speaks to the importance of maintaining a healthy dose of skepticism, even when you're dealing with the seemingly paranormal. Right. Not every unexplained event is a ghost, and sometimes the explanation is more prank than poltergeist. Exactly. But then Estep says that after the car headlight incident, things started happening at the church. Strange sounds, lights in the tower... Almost like whatever was lurking in the shadows was just waiting for its moment. And this is where his ability to think on his feet, to adapt to changing circumstances, really shines through. He deals with the pranksters, keeps his team calm and focused, and then seamlessly transitions back into investigation mode. It's a good reminder that paranormal investigators need to be quick-witted and resourceful, not easily rattled by unexpected events. It's almost like they're detectives of the unknown. Exactly. They have to be ready for anything, whether it's a mischievous couple with a flashlight or something truly unexplainable. And speaking of unexplainable, a step then describes hearing these bizarre sounds coming from a nearby field, something large moving around. His team heard it too, and they couldn't figure out what it was. This encounter taps into something that I find particularly fascinating the limits of human perception. Are our senses heightened in these supposedly charged environments? Or are we more susceptible to suggestion, our imaginations running wild? It's like that feeling you get when you're home alone at night and every creak and groan sounds like a potential intruder. Yeah. Your mind starts to fill in the blanks, creating its own sense of unease. Precisely. And in a place like St. Botos, with its history and the weight of expectation, it's easy to see how our perception can be skewed, even if subconsciously. And as if the strange sounds weren't enough, one of Estep's team members had an even more unsettling experience while he was dozing off. He felt someone or something breathing in his ear. Oh, gosh. That's the kind of story that would send chills down anyone's spine. Yeah. And it raises questions about the nature of these entities if they exist. Are they simply residual energy, echoes of past events? Right. Or are they something more conscious, even malevolent? A step doesn't offer any easy answers, which I appreciate. Yeah. He presents these experiences honestly without trying to force a particular explanation and leaves it to the reader to draw their own conclusions. It's a reminder that sometimes the most fascinating discoveries are the ones that lead to even more questions, pushing us to keep seeking, keep wondering. So after surviving the demon church, a step sets his sights on a new frontier for paranormal investigation. The United States. I have to admit, I always associate haunted locations with old castles and ancient ruins. Yeah. But as Estep discovers, the paranormal isn't confined to one continent or historical period. And this is where his work becomes even more relevant for us. He's investigating places that are closer to home, challenging the idea that hauntings are only found in Gothic novels or far-off lands. He shows us that the paranormal, if it exists, is all around us. He investigates everything from a murder house to a historic firehouse and even a grand hotel. Talk about a diverse portfolio of spooky locations. And each location presents its own unique set of challenges and potential for paranormal activity. For example, you have the Hammer House murder case. Right. It's exactly what it sounds like, a gruesome crime scene. A man bludgeoned to death in his sleep with a hammer. You'd think if any place would be haunted by the violence of the past, it would be this house. And yet, a step doesn't find any concrete evidence of a haunting there. It's a reminder that there's no formula, no guarantee that a tragic event will translate into paranormal activity. Sometimes the energy dissipates, or maybe it manifests in ways we don't yet understand. Which makes the contrast with his next investigation even more intriguing. He investigates Hose Company Number 3, a historic firehouse, and... Let me tell you, this place is practically bursting with paranormal energy. It's like stepping into a different dimension compared to the Hammer House. Yeah. Estep describes a palpable energy in this firehouse, almost as if the walls themselves are buzzing with unseen activity. And then there are the stories. Stories that would make even the biggest skeptic raise an eyebrow. Like the fire engine that supposedly started itself up and crashed through the firehouse door. Imagine that. A massive fire engine just rumbling to life and plowing through a closed door seemingly with a mind of its own. It's like something out of a supernatural action movie. You said it, but it gets even weirder. There's the story of the fire chief's car, seemingly driving itself around town, making multiple 90-degree turns before ultimately crashing right back into the firehouse. And those 90-degree turns are particularly interesting. If it was just a mechanical failure, wouldn't the car have continued on a more or less straight path? 
Those sharp turns suggest something more deliberate, almost as if someone or something was in control. It's like the car was on autopilot, but the destination was predetermined by some unseen force. A step leaves you wondering, was it just a series of bizarre coincidences or if something more inexplicable was at play? What do you think? It's definitely a head-scratcher. On the one hand, you have the mechanical aspects of the car to consider. But on the other hand, the circumstances surrounding the event, those deliberate turns, are hard to ignore. Yeah. It makes you wonder what other possibilities might exist beyond our current understanding. ASEP's investigations at the firehouse really highlight the diversity of paranormal experiences. It's not always about cold spots and disembodied voices. Sometimes it's about objects behaving in inexplicable ways, as if imbued with a strange, almost mischievous energy. It's a good reminder that if we're open to the possibility of the paranormal, we need to be open to it manifesting in unexpected ways. It might not always fit neatly into our preconceived notions of what a haunting should look like. You know, we've been talking about haunted firehouses and creepy churches. Right. But what about the human element in all of this? Oh, absolutely. It's step. He doesn't shy away from the more personal, emotional side of paranormal investigation. No, he doesn't. In fact, he dedicates a whole section of his book to what he calls close encounters. These are those experiences that really shook him, that yeah. made him question everything he thought he knew. There's this one story that really stuck with me. It's his encounter with a dying woman who promised to visit him after she passed. It's a powerful story. Yeah. And it speaks to, I think, a universal human experience the desire to connect with loved ones even after death. Estep was working as a paramedic at the time, and he encountered this woman in her final moments. She was calm, almost serene, and she mm -hmm. told him very matter-of-factly that she would visit him. And here's the kicker. Years later, he still keeps a camera by his bed, just in case. Oh, wow. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Did that woman's words plant a seed in his mind? Did they make him more open to the possibility of such an encounter? Or was it simply a gesture of respect for her belief, a way of honoring her memory? It's those kinds of stories, those personal touches that make Estep's book so compelling. It's not just about cold, hard evidence. It's about the emotional and spiritual impact these experiences have on the people who have them, including the investigators themselves. Exactly. He's not just observing these phenomena from a distance. He's allowing himself to be affected by them, to be changed by them. And that vulnerability, that willingness to be open to the unknown, it's what makes him such a relatable and trustworthy guide through this mysterious world. It's a good reminder that sometimes the most profound insights come from looking inward, from examining our own experiences and beliefs, rather than just focusing on external evidence. Speaking of examining, one investigation Estep details really brings the detective work to the forefront, the face at the kitchen door. Oh, interesting. This case is a great example of how Estep approaches paranormal investigation with both an open mind and a healthy dose of skepticism. He receives an email from a woman named Carol who owns an inn in a remote part of Colorado. Okay. This inn, the Millsite Inn, it sounds like something out of a ghost story itself, isolated with a long history. Carol tells Estep that she, her husband, and several staff members have all seen this apparition. An old man in dungarees and a plaid shirt. A classic ghostly image, right? But instead of just jumping into ghost hunting mode, Estep starts by asking Carol about more mundane possibilities. You know, he inquires about her medical history, any medications she might be taking, anything that could potentially explain what she's experiencing. He's ruling out the explainable before diving into the unexplainable. Oh, is that it's it? like he's approaching it from both a scientific and an empathetic perspective. Precisely. He wants to understand the full picture, the context of these experiences, before drawing any conclusions. He even travels to the Millsite Inn, battling a back injury and brutal winter weather, to get there. Talk about dedication. That's commitment. So he gets to the inn. What happens next? Do they find this mysterious old man in dungarees? Well, that's the thing. Despite hours of interviews, examining the layout of the inn, and even trying to recreate the conditions under which these sightings occurred, a step and his team come up empty-handed. No EVPs, no unusual EMF readings, nothing concrete. So frustrating. You'd think with multiple witnesses, a creepy old inn, you'd find something. It reminds you that the paranormal, if it exists, doesn't always play by our rules. Exactly. It has a way of evading our attempts to capture and quantify it. But ASTEP, being the dedicated investigator that he is, doesn't give up. He schedules a follow-up investigation, bringing in even more investigators and equipment determined to get to the bottom of the face of the kitchen door. Second time's the charm. 
Did they find the ghost of the old man, or what happened? Well, things do get weirder. During the follow-up, one of the investigators catches a glimpse of a man's face outside a window. The same description that Carol and her staff had given. Okay. But just like before, it's gone as quickly as it appears. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. Okay. It's there one minute, gone the next. And then there's this incident with the camera malfunction. Estep is taking pictures of the windows, and suddenly his camera dies. Batteries are dead. Nothing he does can revive it. But as soon as he heads back downstairs, the camera mysteriously powers back up. Okay, that's creepy. It's like the energy of the place itself is messing with their equipment. Do you think there's something to that? That these entities, if they exist, can interfere with our technology? It's certainly a possibility, isn't it? We've all had those moments where our phones glitch out or our laptops freeze for seemingly no reason. But in a place like the Millsite Inn, with its history and the reported paranormal activity, it's easy to see how those glitches could take on a more sinister meaning. It's like our rational minds are trying to make sense of something that defies rational explanation. So what's the verdict on the face at the kitchen door? It remains a mystery. Estep doesn't offer a definitive answer, and I think that's part of what makes his work so compelling. He's not trying to you know, force feed you a particular belief system or convince you of the paranormal's existence. He's presenting these experiences, these puzzles, and inviting you to engage with them, to draw your own conclusions. And sometimes the most intriguing puzzles are the ones we never fully solve. Exactly. It's about embracing the mystery, acknowledging that there are still things in this world that we don't fully understand, and that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It's what keeps us curious, keeps us asking questions, keeps us exploring, and ultimately, isn't that what it's all about? Absolutely. Richard Estep's In Search of the Paranormal is more than just a ghost hunting memoir. It's a journey of exploration, both internal and external, and a reminder that the most compelling mysteries are often the ones that lead to even more questions. So the next time you hear a bump in the night or feel a chill down your spine, remember Richard Estep and his advice. Keep an open mind, be respectful of the unknown, and never be afraid to ask, what if?